Should I keep talking? <laughs> Yeah. Um, for those watching on the live stream or later, I think we're taping this. I'm Reverend Molly Basquette. Um, so delighted to be here today with Jenny O'Dell. We got, we just scratched the surface in our conversation during church. And this time together, we do have to be out of here by like five of one because there's another event. So we'll just pack in some time. Um, is time, we might hit some things that I didn't get to in the notes that I developed. Um, but I'd also love to give Jenny a chance to talk about whatever is on your mind, your new book. You know, let's just, let's roam. This is a low key space, um, low, low, low key, low, um, not, not low impact, what did I want to say? <laughs> low stress, hopefully. And we also want to hear from you all what, um, what sparked for you during the time, during our time together in the first hour, or if you've read Jenny's book, what questions you have for her. So I guess I'll start here. Um, Jenny, the last chapter of the book is called Manifest Dismantling. And I love that as a concept. It's the opposite of manifest destiny, not this idea that we have a divine mandate to like mow our way across the country and squeeze all the best juices out of everything for, you know, capitalism and white supremacist patriarchy. Um, but really there's value in undoing things, um, you give a couple great examples. There's a dam in Monterey that they just dismantled, right? Because it was backing up with silt and because it was so steep, the steelhead could no longer find their way upstream to spawn. Um, there's a wonderful project that has not been greenlighted, but in the works in Berkeley to turn a parking lot back into indigenous land that is for everyone with a shell mound, with a space for gathering and ritual and a space for everyone to enjoy. Um, there's benefit to undoing, I guess. And, and you say very clearly at the end of the book, you don't have, you know, a, a directive. You don't have a, a roadmap that's a one size fits all for how we can in our individual lives dismantle. Um, but can you give us a little bit of framing for how we might kind of get our own parking lots off of our souls <laughs> <laughs> to, to turn back to paradise from the parking lot? Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, right, I have a line earlier in the book that says the, the parks and libraries of the self are always about to get turned into condos. The parks is, and libraries of the of self? The self. Of the yeah. self are always about to get, so perfect for Berkeley too. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that I mean, this is one of those lessons that I said like earlier that I have to learn over and over again. I think it's this trust in um, something that because of the language that we have to think and speak about things doesn't look like anything. I mean, hence the title. It's not really about how to do nothing, which makes some people really mad. Um, <laughs> but Some of us need permission to do more nothing, yeah, right? Yeah, right. But it's like, it's sort of like the question is like, what even is something or what is doing something. And one of the other examples from the conclusion is um, this concept of do nothing farming, which is a Japanese um, sort of practice that was um, developed by uh, Masanobu Fukuoka. Um, I would say it actually has a lot of similarity to indigenous land practices um, where you're sort of, you're collaborating with pre-existing processes in a landscape. But there's so much humor when he, when uh, Fukuoka talks about it, or he's kind of gleeful in his book, where he's like, I know it looks like I'm going backwards, or like, I know it looks like I'm doing nothing. But he basically figured out a way to farm that required no pesticides, um, no sort of mechanical like tilling, um, and way less labor in terms of like abstract labor, but it requires a lot of attention. So you have to do things at exactly the right time. And in order to do things at the right time, you have to know the land well enough. So, you know, that's, I love that example because it, you know, it sort of messes with your notion of doing something and productivity. Like his farm is very productive. People would go and study with him 
how did you get this farm to be so successful? You turned this whole area that was like arid, you know, rocky outcrop into a farm. And he's just kind of like laughing, like, like I didn't do anything, you know? So uh, <laughs> I think that like some, some of it is like a very, before you even go to do anything or try to do anything, it's just something that you do in your mind around almost like trying to imagine po positive and negative space, like flipping. Mm -hmm. um, like what if it was actually, what if doing nothing is doing something, you know, that kind of thing, you know? So I think it's like almost thought experiments. Yeah. Um, when I, the, for the three months that I have not been a Christian in my life, when I sort of had my own awakening, you know, maturing in faith, I decided I was a Taoist and I was really into the Tao of Pooh. This was in college. It's my first tattoo, you know, Pooh sucking on his paw. And I was really, I think because I'd grown up, you know, I'd grown up a really driven kid in a really driven culture, and I grew up poor, so that sort of gave me extra, like, oomph to get, you know, some momentum, to get some um, lift off. And I was so attracted to Wu Wei, the idea of do without doing. And when I, I reread that part of the book last night, and I thought, what if we could do church like that? What if we could have do, what would do nothing church look like? You know, there was a great line you had. It's the sweet spot between over-engineering and abandonment. And it's like, I think that's sort of where we find ourselves in culture in general after the pandemic. It's like, okay, I said this earlier, we can't keep doing things the way we were. There's a lot of heat loss. You know, there's a lot, it's, this takes a lot of energy and a lot of time, a lot of resources. And some people are done with it all together. Like, you know, the church, the main, mainstream, mainline church has been in decline for a long time. We've kind of leveled off, but a lot of our churches have been um, requiring more and more of fewer and fewer people. Well, can we do it differently in a way that's really restful and life-giving, in a way that uses fewer pesticides and, you know, <laughs> and, and herbicides and requires less labor, but yields more in the way of joy and rest, which is what people really need? Before the pandemic started, um, I was planning my sabbatical, which I had this past summer, and I was writing a grant, and I had just read your book, and I called the grant, How to Do Nothing. <laughs> you know, it's a perfect sabbatical grant proposal title. And my hope for our church while I was away that they would be able to do nothing as well. Like some of the ideas, which we never did follow through on because it was pandemic, were no one will plan anything for worship. Just come, and you'll figure out what happens. Like we have this space... We have microphones, we have hundreds of songs here and here, we have prayers, we have wisdom. What if we just show up and see what happens and let that be church that day? Or every, And maybe we'll get excited, get used to that. Maybe you won't need ministers at all anymore, you know? Maybe I'll be obsolete, Kelly. Like, could that be okay? <laughs> But you see how immediately we start to defend our turf, right? And the way we've always done it and what could it possibly be? And we're scared of, you know, too much spontaneity and what might come up if we just stop. Yeah, I mean, I think like related to that is the fact that something probably like church happens all the time outside of church, right? And like, um, I actually brought my 2014 journal because I, <laughs> I wanted to share... Um, Something that I, so this was lost in my closet for years. I didn't, I thought I didn't have a journal from 2014 because I was too busy. So in, in my head, I was like, oh, that was just the last year, but it wasn't. Um, and there's a moment, which I'm sure you picked up on in How to Do Nothing, where I talk about being at a residency in the mountains and talking to the other resident who's Catholic for a lot of, just, we had these like long conversations and I just sort of very like briefly mention it in the book as like an example of a type of conversation and connection that's very different from like social media basically where it's very dehumanizing and someone's sort of reduced to their utterances and like whatever identifying emoji they have next to their username. Um, and so I found, I hope you don't mind, I just wanna, because yeah, I, I didn't realize, there are a lot of things I didn't realize happened during that residency because I basically had burned out right before it, and it and it was in the mountains. Um, and it wasn't just being in the mountains; it was being with other people that apparently was a very like sort of healing thing for me. So, uh, so I found the moment where I'm talking about talking to this other resident. Um, so I said, uh, I had a long conversation with Mary Beth 
on the roof where we admired the stars. We talked about the guy she keeps almost marrying, about Joe, that's my boyfriend, um, about the return of Saturn, about the Big Bang, about the Bible, about evolution. She is Catholic and our conversation reminded me of the ones I'd overhear my dad having. My dad liked to um, invite in uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and debate with them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, the, the type of conversation I thought people my age were no longer capable of having, where you find actual middle ground, not in a forced conciliatory way, but rather as an actual exchange of different viewpoints. Um, and then I kind of talk about how this reminds me of church, how church must be. Um, and then I said, we talked about how science, and then I have a leaf taped in here, um, <laughs> science can explain so much, but still can't say why and also that science and spirituality shouldn't be seen as antagonistic, but rather as coincident. Um, I was reading The Life of the Mind at the time. The, the question asked by the philosophers in The Life of the Mind is, why is there anything at all? All the intricacy and beauty and specificity and tenacity of life can be observed and parsed, but this can only inspire wonder at the force behind something like evolution. Um, and then I basically say that I have this like aha moment that all of my art is about ob close observation, but I've never applied it to people, which is sort of embarrassing. Um, and I say that uh, every so often an experience comes along that reminds you that behind every pair of eyes is a whole sea, a space as infinite as the one that you inhabit. The subjectivity of her experience has the same depth as yours. The pain felt they felt or feels, their pain felt or feels like yours. Compared to this, um, my everyday dealings with people who aren't close friends almost seems to make them into cartoons, cartoons dictated by whatever small role they play in your life. I think that to truly understand another person as a person, a whole one, is like seeing depth where previously there was only flatness and linearity. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful way to see because it's, it is the opposite of loneliness. So I just wanted to share that in this setting. <sighs> You are so articulate even in your journal. <laughs> that is not fair. <laughs> it's supposed to be the rough draft, right? <laughs> but these thoughts form, spring fully formed from your brain like Athena from Zeus's head. <laughs> That's really beautiful. And it makes me wonder aloud about um, something you said in the book about when, I'll have to find it. We didn't talk about social media at all. We can talk about that now. The, the limited amount of good it's done, the possibilities, but the, the great amount of harm it's done. And you say something about um, how we become less empathetic when we are not embodied. And I wonder now with the wisdom, you know, with insight from observing a, a global pandemic and how social media really did give us access to each other in the only way that we could have access to each other and how for disabled people and older people and you know younger like our elders I think except for one all suddenly entered the digital age you know and fast because it was the only way they could go to church and we had zoom coffee hour um, would you stand by that remark that the disembodiment makes us less compassionate or less empathetic what have you seen I mean, on the one hand, I was very grateful for those technologies that allowed us to stay connected. I was also teaching online, so being able to continue doing my job, um, I was grateful for that. I kind of make a distinction, though, between technologies that people use to just, you know, contact one another, like a group chat, for example, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, something like Instagram or Twitter, because one of them, or one, you know, one of those things is just, not that it's neutral, but it is just sort of a medium for connection. The other one is like very much like a game that has rules and there's a way to win and that everyone who uses that medium sort of knows what the goal is, even if you don't decide to participate in that. And it actually just made me even angrier about the things that I'm angry about in this book. I started to think about something like Instagram as um, analogous to Nestle, like bottling public water supply yeah. because it's like we all have the need to be connected to each other and keep up with what's going on with other people and it's like having to do that with ads in the middle um, and have and in a medium where I see three-dimensional you know people that I know like close friends positioning themselves and portraying themselves in a way that's so yeah. formulaic um, no disrespect right like I've done it too um, me too. But it, it just made me, it, I kept also comparing it to just like the mall. Like I don't want to hang out at the mall. Yeah. 
You know, it's like I want to hang out over there, <laughs> you know. And maybe it's still online, but it's the specificity of the sort of business model and the way that the that social media platforms are constructed that I find, you know, was, you know, fa like Facebook themselves, they reported that their usage went up, like it skyrocketed during the pandemic, and that was great for them, yeah. for their for their bottom line. Yeah. So I just feel, I still feel weird about that. You have a great line, you sort of sum it up and you say, um, social media has a financial incentive to keep us in a profitable state of anxiety, envy, and distraction. And I read that, I was like, damn, yep, that's it. And when I've gotten off of Facebook is primarily where I am, you know, it, to some degree, I'm a public theologian. It feels like, you know, obnoxious to say that about myself, but you know, for like a moderately sized church in the Bay Area, we're one of the larger Protestant churches. It feels like I have an obligation to say things out loud in public when bad things happen, to frame them theologically for people, to give them prayers. Kelly writes beautiful prayers in disastrous times or times of honoring um, difference or recognizing, you know, calling, supporting people who are on the margins. It, there is a place for that, and yet I've decided recently that I really want to be a private theologian, not a public theologian. Like, I don't have something wonder, I don't have something perfect to say about everything. And you know what, there are a lot of amazing public theologians out there. What if we relied on each other? What if, you know, what if we didn't each have to say something contributing to the general cacophony that's out there? What if we had less content, but made more space for each other on each other, on our platforms? Yeah, right, but, but it's like, that sounds, like that's what I would want, and that's what the structure of current commercial social media makes almost impossible. So it's like, I remember there was a point during the pandemic where I was trying to do all these things to make Twitter livable to myself. Like I had this Chrome extension that made it look different. I had to use like lists instead of the feed. I did, I tried everything. And at a certain point, my boyfriend Joe was like, you're trying to make it be something it's not. You know, like you're trying to play a game with a different goal, you know, like it's just, you know what I mean? And so like there's, I, I never really, like towards the end of the book, I, you can see that I'm just sort of like wishing for something else. Like I just wish there was some other way and maybe it could be more encouraging of that type of interaction. Because the other thing that I've, I feel especially strongly about lately is just um, privacy. So um, Rebecca Solnit just had a new book come out called Orwell's Roses, which is about sort of a rereading of George Orwell um, with a lens on kind of like pleasure and like flower. He had a rose garden. Um, and it's kind of rehabilitating what we tend to see as this very like dour, you know, author on pro propaganda. Um, and one of the things, threads that she picks up, especially in 1984, is like the role of privacy, you know, his relationship with the, you know, the woman in towards the end of the book, um, where they, they are outside, they're like outside of everything. And they're like the, the sort of love the love relationship that they have is very subversive. And so I've just been thinking a lot about like sort of enclaves that shift, you know, and they exist at different scales, but not, ha not only not having to say something immediately about something that's happened, but actually having time to talk to a friend about it or talk to a family member or write to yourself about it um, that maybe, you know, you don't have the answer. Like there are so many things that it's taken me a year to figure out or longer. And it should, like respectfully, right? Like, especially after last summer, right? Like you don't read like one anti-racist book and then you're like, I'm done, you know? But that's kind of the way that social media frames a lot of those issues. And so I really, I've been thinking a lot about those kind of like small and, and those nested, right? Like maybe smaller and not so small conversational spaces that are private and they're not broadcast to just like question mark. Amen. Yeah, so, right, because whatever, I mean, Facebook you can edit, but Twitter you can't edit, so you better get it right the first time. And, like, even Facebook, you know, you get it wrong, you get dragged, right? And I, I think I was really feeling a, a lot of intense pressure to perform in ways that made me feel really disconnected, dissociated from myself a lot, which is why I just periodically have to get off. And I like to say, I, I use Facebook, it doesn't use me, but who am I kidding, really? Like, we all know since the whistleblower, you know, we, we knew 
from how social media, you know, the captains of industry refuse to let their own children use it or refuse to use it themselves. Like they won't smoke their own product. So that should tell us a lot. Um, I had another thought, it's gone. Oh, I know what it is. I, I love that you're presenting this not as a binary because I think what we sort of experience a lot is like either you're wired and you're getting used, you're the product, or, and you're not experiencing your life because you're too busy Instagramming it. Like you're not present to your own life and, um, and your own, like you're capturing your children's cuteness and not actually like with your children. Um, or you're, you know, a Luddite, you're off the grid, you're just like fully immersed in like the real world, in your own real life. But there is something in us, we are social creatures. Like you want to share that moment. You want to have a conversation about it, even with yourself by journaling. You're reminding us that it's not a binary, that there's, you know, they're capitalizing on this social impulse in us, right? And that's, there's nothing wrong with that social impulse. It's how we're made. We're made to be interdependent. We belong to one another. It's why we call ourselves the body of Christ, you know, in Christian circles. Um, there's just, an, we can choose another way to share and like, to be perfectly cute about it. Yeah, I mean, I have this joke now that I, uh, for me, sharing something is I, I send it to six different people and I just go through my, it's like the same six people every time. And it's like, that's when you know, like, that's my like meme <laughs> is when I like send it to, I just go through the list and send it to six different people. That's like my new equivalent of posting something to Instagram. So it's not a group text. It's, it's six different. It's six different people. Okay. <laughs> um, but I also, um, recently I thought of this term, uh, nature extrovert because in the book I mentioned that I, the phrase being alone in nature doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you're never alone in nature. Um, and so I think like part of, there's, there's, you know, I try not to have a binary between the like on and off, but there's also I think a false binary between alone and together. Mm -hmm. Like if mm -hmm. you see someone the sort of like the stock image of someone like hiking alone, it looks like solitude. Yeah, you're alone, you're not around other humans, um, but you're around a lot of beings and life. Um, and I, I, I mean, I go hiking alone quite a bit and it feels very social to me. Like I'm going to see what's growing, what has changed since the last time I was there. Um, I really feel like, yeah, I'm like checking up on friends. Um, and so I think that there's also like when you sort of frame it through that lens, um, there's also not so much a binary, um, you know, this, cause it's very easy to get uh, into the sort of like, dis, you should be more disconnected from everything. Um, and I think that actually sounds quite depressing and not something to strive for. How about y'all? What are, what's cooking in your imaginations? What do you want to ask Jenny or what do you want to comment to kind of draw this conversation out. I'll, I'll, I'll walk down there and put you on the spot so you can speak right into the mic. Husband, no. <laughs> I can't call him my husband. <laughs> well, this, this book really appealed to me because I have been feeling since the pandemic that I haven't been doing anything. You know, I've been doing nothing. And it doesn't feel okay to me. I keep thinking when I get to the end of the day, I have to be able to list, I did this, this, and this. And so this book might help me to continue doing nothing. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I hope it, yeah, it gives, I, I think it's trying to give sort of permission and language for, for that. And I noticed that my new measure for the, you know, like, I don't want to use the word successful, but the, the way that I, instead of di how much did I accomplish in a day, like I sort of measure my days, not all the time, right? I go back and forth, but um, by how spoken to I felt. Cause you know, there's some days where I, sometimes I think of it as like a windshield, like there's stuff on your windshield and you can't see, you could sort of see what's in front of you, but not really. And then there's other days where it's incredibly clear and you feel very touched by everything and you can hear everything and everyone who speaks to you is a person, not an object. Um, and like, that's, that's what I, that's my measure of, you know, value of a day. And the more I think you pay attention to that, it's easier to kind of get away from the other way of a more traditional way of evaluating. Yeah. How much, 
how good you were at your day. <laughs> Where do we ever even get this idea that that's the goal, that that's what we're supposed to be or do? You know, the people who accomplished during the day. I mean, all of our sacred stories are about this being spoken to, are about this I-thou encounter. It is about that observational arrows. Like, where did you fall in love during the day? Where did you allow yourself to be loved? Where did you, where were you tended? You know, where were you mutually attending? Like, why can't we center that? Julie, do you have your hand up? So Jenny was kind enough to listen to me blather about this earlier, but I really liked that she raised um, up the book, What Can a Body Do? And how that dovetails with what you've written. Because, you know, when I had my car accident six years ago and I, you know, I was unable to be a completely overeager lawyer working unbelievable hours all the time. And the paradigm shift that, um, that had to take place in myself and it's still taking place is not valuing myself by my productivity. And um, I was really glad to hear you say that sometimes you have to be reminded over and over and over of things because I still have to be reminded over and over and over of the fact that my worth is not in my productivity and that, um, yeah, and I'm grateful for those who remind me of that all the time so thank you thank you and i also think like we sort of need to cut ourselves some slack because part of the reason you have to learn something over and over again is because everything that surrounds us is telling you the same thing so it's like i mean in the current book that i'm writing i think i just compare it to like when you turn on the tv most channels are in english like it's just the same way right it's like most of the language that surrounds you whether it's people talking or, you know, ads or whatever, just sort of ambient cultural assumptions, like we're completely surrounded by that. So you, it's really like you have to maintain some kind of resistance against that. And I find it's really hard to do that alone. And so like even just having two or three other people that you talk to and try to maintain or put into practice, like these other, <laughs> other values, right? Like that's what maintains because if you don't have that, you're just going to get washed over by this language and it's going to be really easy to fall back into because it's the one that we're used to. Maybe the best thing we can do to be church is to welcome the stranger and then remind each other every week how to do nothing, right? <laughs> um, my friend Aaron, who's a UCC pastor, who's preached on Jenny's book, and I were talking last week and getting excited about today, and he was helping me frame some questions, and he noticed that even our culture of self-care, you know, that's such a, like, word for the 2010s, um, self-care, first of all, it's sold to us. It's like something you have to buy and something you have to sort of keep the machine, you know, you have to, you have to pay for it to do it, and it's... And it's always in the interest of being more productive when you're done caring for yourself, right? So even like the self-care, it's such a, it's, it's such a, what's the word I'm looking for? Scam, <laughs> that's the word. It's a scam. Thank you, Oliver. Um, it's, it sucks, right? It's like such a trap. So that was one thought. Another thought is gone. But I see some <laughs> hands up, so that's great. Robin. So there's been some times in my life and probably others where the idea of this would be a real luxury to me when I'm in the middle of throes of some big, usually at home, a big child raising thing or caretaking for somebody or trauma here or there. Public and health nurse, yeah. oh, yeah. this kind of um, thought when I was in those situations would have been a luxury that I could not access at that time. I'd be exhausted just, I don't mean about a job, it could be a job, plain old living where I wouldn't have the strength to go this way. Um, so that's just a thought for many of us have those times in our lives where it's overwhelming and to have this thought would be something when you're in the middle of it, when I was, it would be an unimaginable luxury to focus on this more than five minutes. It's a nice idea 
when you're in the middle of the pit. <laughs> yeah. But it's hard to think beyond what's coming at you. So I just wanted yeah. to mention that. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I, uh, I, uh, I, I so much am bothered by the discourse of self-help and actually my current book is almost like a critique of um, time management that tells individuals that they need to do more with less because many of those individuals can't, it's not on them, it shouldn't be on them. Um, and so I make, you know, I'm trying to make gestures in the book toward more collective structures, like I have put a lot of emphasis on public space. Um, but I also think that, um, I'm just thinking about a conversation I had with um, this woman who's the admin of a Facebook group for working moms that I interviewed for the current book. And she was just kind of musing about how it would make a lot of sense for her to get six other friends and each one who also have children and maybe like one of them would make dinner each night of the week. Like she's it's just naturally you go in the direction of like, I can't do this alone. So like, I don't expect this to be done alone ever. Um, and actually it wouldn't make no sense because it's about not being a sort of ego anyway. So it sort of has to be done in concert. But yeah, I definitely, I, that's definitely something that came up a lot you know, when I was doing events or like radio shows, like people would call in being like, I, that sounds nice. <laughs> um, and actually that thought is what prompted my, my second book is me kind of trying to address that and talk about the difference, for example, between someone who has no time, which would be like me, uh, like because you're an overachiever or something versus like someone who has no time, has no temporal autonomy. And what is the relationship between those two groups of people? Um, and so I think that's really, it's a really important distinction to make. And it also makes it clear that, you know, whatever latitude any particular individual has um, should be put to service of trying to increase that for everyone, especially those who have none, so. Um, I am been talking to myself about my why I want to stay so productive and I have produced a lot, and I write, and I paint, all of that. And I know that it's because I want to be liked, I want to be included, and I want to be loved. That's why I'm doing it all. And if, if I could get that out of the way, what would I really want to paint? What, what would delight me? Maybe I just want to dance or something around alone in the room or something. Um, so it's still kind of my Achilles heel. And I probably will continue to hope I'll also be loved when I do things like that. <laughs> yeah, that just reminded me of the really lovely part of Sarah Hendren's book, uh, What Can a Body Do?, where she's talking about her son who has Down syndrome and how different his approach to learning is, where she says that he still, he engages with activities out of joy, joy and curiosity, because he's not measuring himself against others because that is not available to him. Um, like, all of that discourse tells him that he's behind. But from his point of view, he doesn't see, he actually has almost like a superpower where he doesn't see that kind of ranking. Um, and that allows her to kind of access that through him. And I just, it's a really lovely description of like what, yeah, what would it mean to engage with something purely out of like, I just feel like doing that. Um, because it seems like pleasurable and I'm curious. That also, Molly, what you said made me think about Richard Rohr, um, who's one of my spiritual heroes, who said, what if we could get our ego fix, our, or essentially our love fix, all the way from, like, directly from the top? Like, just know our belovedness. I call this my God esteem instead of my self esteem. Like, my self esteem fluctuates a lot depending on the day or what's going on or how cute my hair is. My God esteem is pretty stable because I just know from... Having experienced it at Silver Lake, Emily and I went to church camp together back east from good church all the way down and just from my own soul that God couldn't love me any better. And if I can stay connected to that, I don't have to be so busy being loved on this plane. You know, not to make that a false binary, but yeah. Kathleen. Um, related to Robin's comment that uh, some, a lot of people just don't have time to do nothing. Also, a lot of people just, I feel, aren't exposed to this kind of countercultural reflection. They're just kind of moving through life and then they might never 
see this as an option. So I'm curious what you think of the role of institutions or other kinds of structures in inviting this way of being because people might not get exposed to it otherwise? Yeah, that's a really good question that I sort of have tormented myself with for a long time because I taught. Um, and so for me, like that was, I, so I taught art at Stanford, but I was an adjunct. Um, and so sometimes I would want to put certain values into practice in my classroom. And I think I did sometimes, but I can only get away with so much because I'm an adjunct, right? And then I sometimes I would do this like sort of horrible thought experiment where it's like, okay, well, I have this amount of leeway. Um, the art department wants to get funding compared to other departments, so they have to show results. The school wants to stay competitive compared to other schools. You know what I mean? And I'm like, you could just keep going forever until you get to like, I don't know, glo globalization or something. <laughs> um, and it's like, I don't know. I was just like tormented by this question. It's like, who can take, where's, who can take on the risk? of doing something that appears backward compared to the prevailing notions of productivity. And I honestly haven't really landed on a, an answer. I mean, I did, um, I was in a, a Zoom conversation with a group that Mia Birdsong was in. I maybe some of you are familiar with Mia Birdsong. Um, and I said that and she responded to me that, she's like, I think you're just talking about a culture shift you know, like, which is how people talk about things. So there's just, I don't know, there's like this really weird sort of gray area between like institutions and non-institutional like interaction um, that is hard, I think, to like parse. Um, like it's, some, it's something that happens maybe in between those two, but, and then hopefully, right, like if you get, if you, you shift the culture enough, then it gets sort of enshrined in some kind of institutional you know, like expectation or rule or something like that, like, you know, having more paid leave or something or having uh, universal childcare or, you know, but it's like, I feel like those things are connected to how just people talk about things on an everyday level. Like, because I think before I thought of those as being very separate. It's like, there's the things that we talk about in person and then there's just like laws that are being decided by other people, you know? Um, and now I see them as there's like this sort of continuum between them and like the more we sort of like talk about things in a certain way and draw attention to them, it sort of like widens things a little bit so that maybe you can get to a point where you have these like policies that actually open up space and time for people. Well, and I wonder too if we're watching that happen in real time with the so-called great resignation where people are not going back to work and not taking credit low-wage jobs and demanding better benefits and just more of a say-so in how they work and how they live. And like, I really hope this is gonna make some permanent change in our culture. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember where I read it, but someone somewhere I was reading about how just like two people at work talking about something that's, you know, unsafe or unsatisfactory, that's like the sort of embryonic form of a union. It's just, it's not, the, it's not a union, the two people, right? But it's the beginning of something that leads to some, something that is beyond what one individual person can achieve by, for example, just like quitting or something. Um, and so that's, I think that that's where I'm really interested in that kind of like moving from that conversation to the larger structural thing, the kinds of things that only a union can accomplish. I appreciated in your in the sermon today that you said don't refer to women who are at home with their kids as not working, right? And so I wondered um, to what extent, I haven't read your book, but I bought it, um, to what extent you refer to that in the book, the reproductive labor, the caring economy, and all that around the economics and, and the language of it. But also, since you said you wrote the book before the pandemic, and the pandemic has really lifted up and centered those discussions, you're thinking now, if, if you would, if there's anything different you would say about it, or if it, you would build on what you wrote in the book. Yeah, I, my example that I give, I think in chapter one that relates to that is actually a conceptual artist who I really love and was really inspiring to me early on, um, Mirli later Minukulis, who um, makes what has been described as maintenance art. Like she would do a performance like cleaning or scrubbing the steps of the institution that she was exhibiting in. 
Um, and she also wrote a really amazing document called the Maintenance Manifesto that's actually the plan for an exhibition that never happened. But the, the exhibition would have been essentially documentation of her work as a mother. And she has this phrase in there somewhere that's like, my work is the work. <laughs> um, and so she, and she makes this distinction between the life force and the death force. And the life force is everything that would kind of fall under reproductive care and maintenance. Um, and then the death force, um, I write in the book, it reminds me a lot of disrupt <laughs> in Silicon Valley, like the way that gets used, like um, sort of individual getting ahead um, and, uh, you know, make th move, move fast and break things, right? Yeah. Uh, and so she's sort of my model for someone who, you, who creates a language um, that allows you to see that distinction and sort of value it differently. I kind of get more into that in this current book um, with Marilyn Waring. Um, but yeah, I, so I, I talk about it some amount in the book. And then I guess, yeah, during the pandemic, it really was an opportunity to just I think for a lot of people to just reflect on, you know, if not enacting it, right? Like I don't have children, um, but just think about all of the jobs and types of work that go into keeping things simply running. And those things really came to the fore. I mean, something that I had been interested in um, as a, from a more abstract, like artistic point of view. And in, in 2014, I had a show that was all about infrastructure. So it was like, you know, uh, wastewater treatment plants, um, you know, uh, power like stations, you know, all of the sort of structure, like literal structures. Um, and so I had been interested in that in a long time and the fact that you, people only learn about the systems in the diagram in the newspaper when something goes wrong. There's a disaster, they always show a diagram with the arrows, what happened, and you're like, oh, that's what a substation does, right? Um, and so I feel like the pandemic was more sort of people-focused version of that for me, where it's like all of these you know, legions of people that we all rely on, you know, that are very far flung are suddenly come to the foreground, right? Um, so, and I, I'm, it's one of those things where I'm like, I, I'm worried about that wearing off, that awareness. That's one of the things that I think we should keep. Because with that awareness comes a lot of gratitude, right? Like how toilet paper makes its way to the global supply chain. Like, like in our bodies, we were very grateful when we had toilet paper and the toilet paper we liked, not just any toilet paper. Um, and gratitude is a lot of the spiritual life. It it's, gives us access to our best joy. I, yeah, I would also add one other thing is that uh, the Rose Garden, which is, this book is largely based on, um, one, basically the entire idea for the talk that turned into this book just came out of the Rose Garden, which just came out of me spending time there. And one of the things that you see, uh, you know, besides non-human forms of life, is you see people, you see maintenance volunteers. Like, it's just something that you see when you're there. It's very regular, it's very available to you. Um, and roses, you know, they require a lot of work um, and during all times of the year. Uh, and I very frequently hear people walk up to uh, volunteers and thank them. Like, that's a very regular thing. So it's like, it's as a space, it really embodies a lot of these things where it, it requires so much volunteer labor and it doesn't produce anything, but everyone in the neighborhood agrees that it's valuable. Um, and it's sort of a very, um, yeah, the way people use the park is very different. And yeah, so it's just as a space, it really encapsulates a lot of those things. Good church, it sounds like good church. <laughs> is there maybe one more question or comment for Jenny? Yeah, Emily. Jenny. Hi. I've always been like really amazed by people whose life is very like who know how to really slow down and a lot of times still do so much um, but also do it in a very slow way and have a lot of space around things and I am like incredibly delusional about how long things take and I just can't even believe even if I know that I do that I'll think okay I'm going to do these few things and I'm gonna really try to leave space around things, like before and after, leave buffers. But the delusion is so deep. And um, if you could talk a little bit about that, that phenomenon. Um. Oh yeah, that's real. I, I feel that <laughs> all the time. And I, the thing, the, the image that I have in my head these days is um, 
there's there's a bit in my current book about the history of Taylorism, like Frederick Taylor going into factories and trying to, you know, uh, basically de-skill all of the work and make it go faster and make it way more meaningless um, for all of the workers. And there's that like famous story of him getting the one guy to work faster and then that guy becomes the standard. And it's like widely acknowledged that like that was not a humane like sort of amount of work for that man to be doing, but he found a guy to do it, right? Um, and then now everyone is expected to, to work at that standard. And, uh, or even like Ford, for example, like the company, they, they very much took on Taylorist principles, like they had a really high turnover rate because it was really hard. And so it's like, is that, it doesn't seem like a sustainable way of working or a rate of working, and yet that is the expectation. And that's always what I think about in my head where I'm like, do I have a little Taylorist time study man <laughs> who comes in and looks at the hours that I have available and is like, I think you could get, like, I think you could 10X your productivity, you know, and it's like, uh, yeah, that's, and, and it's really strange to think about how that form of um, industrial time, which was a thing that happened in history, is now also part of my psychology, and I didn't choose that just because of the time that I was born, you know? So, um, so I think it's, it's, that's been helpful for me to think about, like, who, who's timing me, who's making that decision about the amount of output that is expected to come from this time, and who even is, Who's, who's writing the spreadsheet, you know? It's not really me, um, or it's some, some part of me, right? But what is that part and where did it come from? And it's a morbidly fascinating line of questioning to go down. And of course, Ford is often celebrated for giving us the weekend, right? Like Ford invented the weekend. We got two days off instead of one because of him in the early in the industrial era. But what else, you know, what other forms of harm did he invent that were just adopted as standard practice? Um, I love to read about like pro productivity and, and time management studies and actually how um, the less we work, the more productive we are. You know, like after a certain number of hours a week, we're really no good. Um, and then it's just sort of performative busyness. And um, I forget what episode it was, but I was listening to the Ezra Klein show a couple months ago. It might have been the one about AI, actually, probably. It was like a two-hour one, but it was so good. I told you it covered a lot of territory. And the guest talked about how futurists and technologists 50, 40, 50 years ago predicted that we would reach a point at which we, after which we would only really have to work like 15 hours a week. And they predicted it would come in like 1993 and it came like 15 years sooner than they expected. It came in like the late 70s. But look at us in 2021. It's insane what we expect of people, rich, poor, everyone in between, global south, global north. It's, it's just like there are very, and he talks about um, the few tribes that are really like have not been affected by global capitalism and how they function and they're much more, they're not competitive societies. They really have like figured out their own, they are mutual aid societies. Anyhow, that just, along with Jenny's book, like Kelly said, really has made me think about my life. It's one of the reasons why um, I want to drop down from full time to 32 hours a week next summer so I can live more. If I can put in a little commercial for myself here. Um, <laughs> And I also want to model that for our congregation that, you know, like I should just be hitting my stride, right? I should be like peak, peak potential. And this feels like a holy calling to do a little less and live a little more. Sorry, I didn't mean that to turn into like <laughs> <laughs> pee into working less, but I was feeling it. Um, Jenny, any last thoughts you have? Anything you have in your notes or really want us to hear before we wrap up today? Um, actually, can I just read? I wanted to read a quote yes. from Rebecca Solnit's book because it's like stuck in my head. Um, and um, like I said, one of those questions that I get stuck on is what is the role of retreat and also of like pleasure in this particular time? So she's writing about um, that kind of question. And she says, the artist Zoe Leonard was bashful about making beautiful images during the AIDS crisis and said so to fellow artist and activist David Wojnarowicz, who replied, quote, Zoe, these are so beautiful, and that's what we're fighting for. We're being angry and complaining because we have to, but where we want to go is back to beauty. 
if you let go of that, we don't have anywhere to go. And then Solnit says, so beauty can be both what one does not wish to change and where one wishes to go, the compass or rather North Star for change. Leonard reflects on their interchange, quote, you know, we were all just too busy for beauty. We were too angry for beauty. We were too heartbroken for beauty. I felt like an asshole with these pictures of clouds, but David was right. You go through all of the fighting, not because you want to fight, but because you want to get somewhere as a people. You want to help create a world where you can sit around and think about clouds. That should be our right as human beings. Amen. <laughs> Jenny, thank you so much thank for you. being here today. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you all. Good to know your neighbor. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone for coming out. There may be a few books left. I don't know if you didn't get one and you decided now you want one or more than one. <laughs>